Well, good morning, New Hope. Glad to be here with you this morning. Don't these guys do a great job up here? They just do wonderful. Thank you guys so much for the work you put into that. You know, I, I wanted to say, my wife just actually reminded me, uh, this Friday, we're going to have a Good Friday service, and I'm not sure if we put that in the announcement. So if you would remember that, this Friday at 7 p.m., please join us right here at New Hope uh, for a Good Friday service. Would you bow your heads in prayer before we begin? Father, thank you for your kindness and your mercy. Lord, this morning we're especially mindful of the fact that Lord, you, you did come into town as a king, Lord, and, and right after you were crucified by the same people that, that praised you. Lord, we're like that sometimes. I know I'm like that sometimes. Lord, one moment I'm praising you, and the next it seems I'm blaming you for something in my life and casting accusations at you. Father, forgive me for that. Lord, forgive us when we forget who you are. Forgive us when we forget how great you are. Forgive us when we forget how unchanging you are. And Lord, this morning, we are so mindful of the fact that we do indeed have so many blessings in our lives. The measure of health that we enjoy, the family, the loved ones, the great country in which we serve. Lord, bless those who serve her in the military, armed forces, those who are police and firemen and serve her in various ways. Protect them, Lord. Be with their families. Comfort them. Draw them to yourself. Lord, we lift up political leaders, regardless of their political opinions. Lord, we ask that you bless them. You give them your wisdom to guide and to govern this country in a way that is godly, in a way that fulfills your purposes. And this morning, Father, as we prepare to open your word to, to just learn more about you, Lord, I ask that you open the hearts and the minds of each individual person here, myself included, to just receive what you have for us this morning. Father, we confess that your word, your Bible is our textbook and your Holy Spirit is our instructor and we stand on level ground before the cross this morning before you. And, and so, Father, we just ask that you would give us exactly what you want, Lord. Be glorified today. Accomplish the purpose, Father, that you have for us this morning. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So in our sermon series entitled Foundations, we have been talking about the nature of God, the character of God, the attributes of God. Today, we come to part eight in that series when we ask, what's God like? This is the third part of talking about what God is like, and we talked about some of his characteristics before. Last time, we mentioned something that I really feel bears mentioning again as we're talking about God and the nature of God and the character of God, and that is that uh, theologian R.C. Sproul says, there is nothing in theology that defines everything else as comprehensively as our understanding of God. As we understand the character of God, we, so we will understand every other doctrine. Folks, this is, this is key. If we for any reason miss God's attributes, if we miss God's character, if we miss God's nature, who he is fundamentally in and of himself, then what happens is we begin to miss other doctrines that scripture brings up. We, 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 we misunderstand and we misapprehend those things and we misapply them to our lives. So, so this is critical. Last time, we began to talk about God's incommunicable attributes. And if you remember, we talked about two different categories or classifications of attributes, the incommunicable and the communicable. And we said the easy way to remember that is you remember communicable like a communicable disease. In other words, it's something you can catch. Okay, so <clears throat> God's communicable attributes are those things that he shares with us. To some degree, lesser or greater, we have, to some extent, possessed some uh, of those qualities, those communicable attributes. And then there are incommunicable attributes. And the incommunicable attributes are those that we really don't share with God. And they are the ones that are the, the hardest for us to grasp, the hardest for, one, for us to understand. Last week, 
we spoke, uh, we began to speak of God's uh, incommunicable attributes. And we spoke of the fact that God does not need anything from us or from creation. He didn't even need to create us. He didn't even need to cre uh, uh, create all of creation. In other words, God is completely independent, and that's the doctrine of God's independence. And we spoke of that and how critical, how critical understanding the doctrine of God's independence is to our own self-worth to understanding our place in the universe, to understanding who we are as people, to understanding our value. This week, we're going to talk about the second incommunicable attributes of God. There are more than two, there's several. But the second incommunicable attribute of God that we want to talk about, which is this week, we want to talk about God's immutability. God's immutability. Now that's a big $5,000 word that theologians use. And another word for that is unchangeableness, his unchangeableness. In other words, he does not change. And yes, unchangeableness actually is a word, believe it or not. Um, like the unchangeableness of my stubbornness, my wife might say, you know, so these, these are words, right? So God's incommunicable attributes are, uh, or that we're going to talk about this morning, are his Immutability. That means he does not change. Now, here's how we define this. You say, well, what does this all mean? What, what does it mean that God is immutable or that God is unchangeable? Well, here's how we define that. God is unchanging in his being, his perfections, his purposes, and his promises. Yet, he acts and feels differently in response to different situations. Now, this is going to become very, very important for us to understand, and you'll see quickly why as we move on. First of all, I just want to give you some scriptural basis for, for this doctrine. We don't, you know, we don't just come up with these doctrines. We don't just come up with you know, saying, well, let's see, what would we God, like God to be like, and we come up with this, this stuff. This is scriptural, folks. And so Psalm chapter 102, verse 25 through 27 says, of old, you have laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, that's the heavens, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe. They will pass away, but you, you are the same, and your years have no end. See, God existed for an eternity before he created the universe. Try to wrap your mind around that a little bit. It's difficult. Isn't that hard to even comprehend? God existing for an eternity before he created the universe? What was there before then? I don't know. But he did. And he will continue to exist for an eternity when the universe is gone. God causes the universe to change. But he himself always remains the same. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says, For I the Lord, watch this, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. I love this passage. It's a beautiful passage. Because it says, look, the reason that you guys are still alive, the reason you're not consumed, is because I don't change. My nature, my character, my attributes do not change. I'm still a loving God. I'm still a merciful God. And I always will be. James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is a gift from above. Every good gift and every perfect gift is a gift from above. Coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation and no shadow due to change. That's a wonderful promise. What he's, what he's saying here is that since good gifts come from God, they will continue to come from God because God does not change. It's a wonderful promise. And so these texts, all of these Bible texts that we've been looking at, refer to the unchanging nature of God's being and the unchanging nature of God's character. The unchanging nature of God's being and God's character. Thus, God's immutability also applies not just to his being, 
not just to his character, but a third one. God's immutability also applies to his purposes. To the things that he decides to do. You say, how do you know that? Psalm chapter 33, verse 11, says this. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. I will, uh, Matthew eleven thirty five. 35, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Matthew 25, 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, watch this, from the foundation of the world. When was this kingdom prepared? It was prepared from before the foundation of the world. In other words, before he created anything, anything, he knew who would be sitting in his right hand. It's a wonderful promise. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 says, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. See, he chose us before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1.11 says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. See, God works all things according to the counsel of his will, and he knows his will ahead of time. And he never changes that. It's a beautiful thing. Once God has determined that he will surely bring something about, his purpose is unchanging, and that will be achieved no matter what happens. Now, I want you to understand that there is no other being in all creation that's like this. Everything else in every other being, angels, demons, cherubim, seraphim, you and I, plants, animals, trees, rocks, everything else, all of creation is changing. Its very being is that it changes. God is the only one who is completely changeless. And he causes all things to change. So once God's promised something, he can never be unfaithful to keep it. So we see now that God is changeless in his being, in his character, in his purposes, and in his promises. Now, this is, this is important. That he's changeless not only in his being, not only in his character, but in his purposes and his promises also. Now, I want you to notice something here. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should change his mind. He has said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Is it possible that God could speak and not fulfill it? Well, of course, that's completely impossible. So God is changeless. He is completely changeless in his being, in his character, in his purposes, and then lastly, he's changeless in his promises. Numbers 23. Numbers 23, that's the passage we just mentioned. God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man, that he should change his mind. He has said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and he, he will not fulfill it? So in other words, God is not going to change something that he has decided to do, no matter what else happens. But right here is where we have to be kind of careful. Right here in our theology, at this point in our theology, we have to kind of walk circumspectly here. And I'll show you why. Because long about this time, someone comes along and says, well, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Hasn't God changed his mind in the past? Hasn't scripture told us that God has changed his mind? Aren't there instances in scripture which God, for example, said that he would judge his people and then because of their prayer or because of their repentance did not bring about the judgment that he said he would? For example, yeah, see, he knows. That's a good kid. You keep training him. Exodus 32, 9 through 14 is an example. Isaiah 38, 1 through 6. 
is an example. Jonah 3, 4 through 10 is another example of when God says, look, I'm going to destroy these people. And then he relents. He backs off because of their prayer, because of their repentance. How do we understand these circumstances in Scripture? Well, here's how we understand them. These instances should be understood as true expressions of God's present attitude or intention with respect to the situation as it exists at the moment. If the situation changes, then God's attitude and intentions toward that situation will also change. Thus, while God's purposes, while God's purposes are completely unalterable, unchanging, he does nevertheless respond differently to different situations. You say, well, what's the difference? Well, here's what's the difference. For example, when God told Jonah to, to preach to Nineveh, to go, to go tell them about their sins and to convict them, God sees the wickedness of the city. He sends this prophet in Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, and he says this, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's what God says. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. However, the very fact, the very fact that God would withhold judgment if they repented is implicit in what God is telling Jonah. In other words, God, the whole very purpose for which God is telling Jonah to go tell them this is so that they would repent. It is God's purpose and intention that they would repent, you see. That's how that works. It's God's very purpose and intention that they should listen to Jonah and repent. And so in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, we find this. Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, we find a scripture saying, When God saw what they did, what did God see? Well, how they turned away from evil. When God saw what they did, how they turned away from evil, then God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. You ever, you ever told your kids, if you don't get that room clean, you're not going to play today, right? Yeah. <laughs> I love that kid. And so, and so, your intention is to get them to what? Not play? No. Your intention is to get them to clean their room. That was your intention from the beginning, you see. And that's exactly, by the way, how God works. So thus, God responds differently to changing situations without ever compromising his character or his purpose. And this is why our attitudes towards God when we pray should be profoundly changed by this very thought. You see, the very fact that we can pray and, and as a response to our prayer, God can act differently. That should be extremely, extremely encouraging to us. Now, someone may also object by saying something like, well, wait a minute, aren't there passages in the Bible? Haven't I read, don't I seem to remember some passages in the Bible where God did something or performed something, and then after the fact, he came back and he said, well, I'm sorry that I ever did that. Don't you want the answer to that one? Next week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so here's how this works. There are cases where God said he'll be, that he was sorry that he carried out something that he promised to do. For example, Genesis 6.6 6 is, is an example of that. 1 Samuel 15.10. In Genesis 6.6, 6, he talks about that he's sorry about mankind and the state of mankind. In 1 Samuel 15, he's sorry ab about uh, making Saul the king. How can God be sorry about something he's done? How does that work? Here how, here's how these should be understood. They should be understood as expressions of God's present displeasure toward the sinfulness of man. Now, in neither case, neither the one we talked about before or this case, <coughs> does the language ever require us to think that if God could somehow change things or start all over again or do it all over again, that he would ever uh, uh, change it. He would do the same thing if he had to do it all over again. In fact, the cool thing with God is he does have the chance to do it all over again because he's not bound by time. Isn't that cool? Amen. That's right. What it implies is this, is that it implies that God's previous actions led to events that in the short term caused him grief, caused him pain, caused him sorrow. 
But those same events that caused him grief and sorrow at the moment would eventually lead to fulfill his ultimate purposes in the end. Let me give you an illustration. You spank your child because they've done something bad, right? And here your child is and he's crying and she's wailing. And in the middle of this, as you're spanking your child, the pain that your child is enduring at the moment causes you grief, causes you to be sorrowful. That's what the word means when he says, I'm sorry, I'm sorrowful that I did this, that I had to do it, you see. It's the same thing. A father allowing his teenage son to uh, embark on a course that he knows will bring much sorrow to him, much pain, may lead to disaster. And it brings sorrow to both the parent and the child, but nevertheless, the father allows it. Because he knows, he, because he knows that greater long-term good will come from it. But there is absolutely nothing wrong with you or me as a father at the moment we're doing something, at the moment something is happening or our children are experiencing grief to say, I'm so sorry that this is the situation. In fact, I've said that to my kids ahead of time. I'm sorry that I have to do thus and so, right? So, how can God be sorry he did something? Well, he's simply sorry that he has to do something, but in the end, it, it fulfills his purposes. So hopefully those questions are answered. If you have more on that, come talk to me afterwards. But we have to understand something that's very, very important when we talk about this doctrine, because we're talking about the fact that God doesn't change. He's always the same. His mind, his thinking, his will, they're always the same. So we have to understand something that, that's very critical right now, okay? And that is that God is both infinite and personal. God is both infinite and personal. What do we mean by that? Well, infinite simply means that he's not subject to limitations of creation. He's transcendent beyond all that. He's greater than everything he has made. However, at the same time, he is also personal. This means he interacts with us as a person, and we can relate to him as persons. We can communicate with him. We can worship him. We can obey him. We can love him. And he can communicate with us and rejoice in us and love us and have a deep, personal, intimate relationship with us. God is both infinite and personal. You say, well, what's the big deal? Why are you even mentioning that? What, what, what's the deal on that? Well, I'll tell you. This is one of many, but it's one of the fundamental differences between Christianity and every other religion in the history of mankind. I want you to know today with assurance that there is no such thing of any invented religion out there in the world that has ever existed in the history of humanity that has ever had a God that is both infinite and personal. Doesn't exist. Man can't even conceive of that. In deism, deism portrays God as one who is infinite, but is not personal. The Greco-Roman gods, they are personal, but they are not infinite. In other words, they have weaknesses, flaws, moral failures. Pantheism uh, pictures God as being infinite, but not personal. He is so detached from us and from the universe that he doesn't even care. It's like the force, you know? You ever watch Star Wars and you get into that force stuff, you know, may the force be with you? Well, what is that anyway? It's like this thing that the universe is made up and all of the power and energy and stuff of the universe somehow comes together and makes this force. And how does this force have a will? How does this force have a personal relationship with you? Well, of course, it's nonsense. Why? Why is this the case in all man-made religion? It's because in man-made religion, people reason that if God is infinite, that he cannot be personal. And if God is personal, that somehow he cannot be infinite. But our God transcends those things. The God of the Bible teaches that he is both 
Thus, God is infinite in that he is unlimited with respect to change and that God is also personal in that he relates to us personally and gives us value. Imagine the fact that we can have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe, the one who does not change. That thought, that thought alone is enough. That thought alone is compelling. But let me leave you with this this morning. I want to leave you with the implications of God's immutability. The implications of the fact that God is unchanging and unchangeable. What does it mean for us? Like, okay, so we're sitting here this morning and we hear all this stuff. and Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, it's good. I, uh, yeah, okay, I get that. What's that going to make a difference when we go home? When we, when we get up in a few minutes and go out of here? How's that going to change us? How's it going to change our life? I'll tell you how. At first, when we talk about the idea of God's immutability, of God's unchangeableness, at first, it may seem just abstract. It may seem like good, interesting information, but, but it's so abstract that may, we may not immediately recognize the significance of it. But I want to share something with you. We don't recognize the significance of God's unchangeableness until we consider the alternative. Now track with me for a moment. Track with me for just a moment. Imagine if God could change for the better. If God could change for the better, then he wasn't perfect when we first trusted him. You see, if something changes, it must change either for the better or for the worse. There's no such thing as a neutral change. You either change for the better or for the worse. If God could change at all, then he must change for the better or for the worse. If he can change for the better, then he could not have been perfect when we first trusted him. Oops. And secondly, if God could change for the worse, <laughs> what kind of God then might he become? Ever thought about that? What kind of God then might he become? Might he become a little bit evil? Might he uh, change to become largely evil or totally evil? How about the idea of an all-powerful God that could change to become evil? What a frightening, horribly terrifying prospect that would be. How could we ever trust him? How could we ever place our faith in him? How could we ever commit our lives to him? How could we ever say that he is good? What if he's not good tomorrow? Hmm. Or what if it's possible that his omnipotence could change, his all-powerfulness could change? Then maybe he'll want to keep his promises, but because he's not all-powerful anymore... He won't be able to keep his promises. You see how that works? Folks, a God who is changeable is no God at all. That's how that works. So God is completely unchangeable and unchanging. And that should give us such, such great confidence, such great hope, such great peace. The bottom line is, if God is changeable, if God were or could be changeable, then the whole basis of our faith would be destroyed. We can't place our hope and our, uh, and, 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 and our lives in the hands of a God who could change. He has to be a person who is infinitely worthy of trust. He has to be a person who is infinitely worthy of trust. And that's why God has to be both infinite and personal. God's immutability, the doctrine of God's immutability, is vital for maintaining the distinction between the creator and the creation. It's vital. This directly affects our ability to give him worship and praise. You know, just, just moments ago, we're up here uh, praising him and worshiping him and adoring him, as we will soon again. How could we possibly give praise and worship and adoration to a God that could change? To a God that we can't trust. 
to a God who is no different than his creation. Because his creation changes. See, he has to be beyond his creation. His creation changes. He cannot change. And so here's the good news this morning. It is because of the very fact that God is unchangeable. I say it again. It is because of the very fact that God is completely unchangeable that you are able to place your trust in him. It is because of the fact that he is completely unchangeable that you can give him your life and know and trust that he will forever be gracious. He will forever be just. He will forever be merciful. He will forever be kind. He will always be compassionate. He will always forever be tenderhearted. He will forever and eternity be a loving, loving God. And what a blessing and a comfort that is. I'll leave you with this passage this morning. Psalm 1611. Psalm 1611 says this. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, listen to this. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forever. And folks, if you have ever been in a position in your life where you are seeking joy, where you're seeking full fullness, where you're seeking satisfaction, where you're seeking pleasure, may I tell you that there is no greater place to find it than at the right hand of God who never changes. That promise is for you and for all generations. Everyone who wants to call on his name, everyone who wants to come to him, everyone who wants to surrender their life to him, you can absolutely trust in a God that is completely changeless. Father, we thank you for the fact, Lord, that we can rely on you. In every circumstance, in every situation, Lord, even when life gets difficult, Father, when we begin to question uh, our circumstances, Lord, we can always, always rely that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, you will never change. You are unalterable, Lord. And Father, in your changelessness, you love us and you have called us. And in fact, your word says you have predestined us to be with you, to live with you to be called according to your name, to be at your right hand, to be forgiven of sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for that, and we thank you, Lord, that nothing in the universe could ever change that fact. Lord, I ask that you would help those who are questioning whether you are a God worthy of following. Lord, I ask that you would open their hearts and minds, Lord, that they would completely surrender their trust to you, their lives to you, entrust their souls in your hand. Because, Father, you are merciful, you are gracious, you are kind, you are patient, you are long-suffering, you are loving, and you will never, ever change. In Jesus' name.